Arson attacks disrupt French high-speed rail network just hours before Olympics. France's high-speed rail network was paralyzed by widespread acts of vandalism, including arson attacks, mere hours before the grand opening ceremony of the Olympics. These criminal actions halted travel to Paris from across France and Europe, affecting Olympic athletes and travelers alike. Officials condemned the attacks and launched a national investigation, indicating that the crimes could lead to sentences of 10 to 20 years. The arson attacks caused significant disruptions on the high-speed lines of Atlantique, Nord, and Est, impacting hundreds of thousands of travelers. Two out of four trains carrying Olympic athletes to Paris on the Western Atlantique line were halted, preventing some athletes from reaching the opening ceremony on time. Fortunately, there were no reports of injuries. French Prime Minister Gabriel Attal and the CEO of SNCF, Jean-Pierre Ferrando, emphasized that the attacks were premeditated and coordinated to block the high-speed train network. Intelligence services are actively seeking the perpetrators. Repair efforts are underway, with train traffic resuming on some lines. However, the attack has heightened security concerns, with 35,000 police officers deployed daily in Paris for the Olympics. The city's iconic opening ceremony will proceed as planned, despite these severe disruptions. Authorities are working tirelessly to ensure the safety and transportation of all athletes and visitors during the Games. EU transfers $1.6 billion from frozen Russian assets to Ukraine. The European Union has transferred $1.6 billion from frozen Russian assets to Ukraine to support military and reconstruction efforts against Russia's invasion. These funds, originally held by central securities depositories, were made available to the European Commission earlier this week. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen stated, The EU stands with Ukraine. Today we transfer $1.6 billion in proceeds from immobilized Russian assets to the defense and reconstruction of Ukraine. There is no better symbol or use for the Kremlin's money than to make Ukraine and all of Europe a safer place to live. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, the EU imposed several sanctions, including freezing Russian central bank assets. The sanctions led to an unusual accumulation of cash and deposits on the balance sheets of central securities depositories, generating extraordinary revenue. These revenues are now being channeled to Ukraine, with the first installment transferred on Friday. EU High Representative Josep Borrell emphasized that profits from the frozen Russian assets are being used to support Ukraine's defense industry. He noted, the first tranche of the windfall profits will provide concrete support on the ground. We are not only providing military support to Ukraine but also made in Ukraine, contributing to Ukraine's resilience in combating Russia's war of aggression. The decision to utilize these funds follows proposals by the European Commission and the High Representative with the EU Council mandating that central securities depositories holding significant assets and reserves of the Russian Central Bank must set aside extraordinary cash balances and may not dispose of the ensuing net revenues generated by the EU operators. This financial support marks a significant step in the EU's ongoing efforts to aid Ukraine, with roughly $324 billion in Russian central bank assets frozen by the EU and G7 nations, including the United States, since the invasion began. Russian man arrested for allegedly staging car bombing on Ukrainian orders. Russia's top security agency, the Federal Security Service, FSB, announced the arrest of a man accused of staging a car bombing on orders from Ukraine. The suspect, Yevgeny Serebryakov, was shown in a video being escorted by masked officers after arriving from Turkey. Turkish authorities detained Serebryakov on Wednesday at Russia's request. He had arrived in Bodrum, Turkey just hours after a car bomb detonated in Moscow, injuring two people. Russian media reported that the car belonged to a senior military intelligence officer. The FSB claims that Serebryakov was acting on instructions from Ukraine's spy agency and released a video of his confessions, though the authenticity of these claims could not be independently verified. Ukrainian officials have denied any involvement in the incident. Suspect in murder of anti-Russian politician detained in Ukraine. Ukraine has detained an 18-year-old man in connection with the murder of Irina Faryan, a prominent former nationalist lawmaker who was shot and killed on July 19 near her flat in Lviv. 
President Volodymyr Zelensky announced the arrest on Thursday via telegram. Farian, 60, a divisive but influential figure, was known for her outspoken criticism of officials and military personnel who spoke Russian instead of Ukrainian. She served as an MP for the ultra-nationalist Svoboda Party and was a professor specializing in the Ukrainian language. Despite being fired from her academic post last year after controversial comments, she was later reinstated by court order. The suspect was detained in the eastern city of Dnipro. Interior Minister Igor Klimenko stated that the investigation led them to the suspect through smart surveillance cameras and extensive searches. Klimenko shared a photo of the suspect being detained and indicated that there is sufficient evidence linking him to the crime. Authorities believe the suspect may have acted on orders and rented multiple apartments in Lviv in preparation for the attack. Farian's funeral was held in Lviv, with many mourners paying their respects. Further information about the investigation is expected to be released as it progresses. Argentine President Miley travels to France amid soccer chants controversy. Argentine President Javier Miley arrived in Paris on Thursday, where he is scheduled to meet French President Emmanuel Macron following a diplomatic spat over derogatory chants by the Argentine soccer team. During Argentina's Copa America victory celebrations in Miami, a short clip captured players chanting a song deemed racist towards French players of African heritage. The video, posted by midfielder Enzo Fernandez, led to strong condemnation from French officials. The French Soccer Federation filed a legal complaint, and Fernandez's English club, Chelsea, initiated disciplinary actions. The incident sparked political controversy when Argentina's conservative vice president, Victoria Villarreal defended the team, accusing France of hypocrisy and colonialism. Her remarks further inflamed tensions, leading French diplomats in Buenos Aires to express their outrage. President Miley, a right-wing populist, has attempted to balance nationalistic sentiments with diplomatic efforts. Last week, he removed the Undersecretary of Sport for suggesting an apology from Lionel Messi. His spokesperson later distanced Miley from Villarreal's comments, affirming that relations with France remain intact. Despite the efforts to ease tensions, controversy continued after chaos erupted during an Olympic men's soccer match between Argentina and Morocco. Villarreal shared footage of Moroccan fans invading the field, further fueling nationalist rhetoric. Miley's visit to France includes meetings with Macron and other officials, attendance at the 2024 Olympic opening ceremony and talks with French business leaders. These meetings are part of Argentina's efforts to secure support from major international monetary fund, IMF, shareholders, including France and the US, for additional funds. IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva praised Argentina's economic reforms in recent talks but did not mention an imminent new loan. Argentina, the IMF's largest debtor, seeks more funds to repay past borrowing under a program initially worth $57 billion in 2018. Analysts suggest that Miley is hopeful for favorable political support from a potential future Trump administration in the U.S., the IMF's main stakeholder, to exert pressure on the IMF for Argentina's benefit. YouTube speeds in Russia may drop significantly to pressure company, says senior lawmaker. YouTube speeds on desktop computers in Russia may decrease by around 40% this week and up to 70% the following week, according to a senior Russian lawmaker close to the authorities. This measure aims to persuade the video hosting site to reinstate blocked Russian channels. Alphabet's YouTube has faced significant criticism in Russia for removing channels that broadcast Russian state media. Russia has also fined Google multiple times for not removing content deemed illegal or undesirable by the Russian government. Alexander Kinstein, head of the State Duma's Committee on Information Policy, stated on Telegram, the degradation of YouTube is a necessary step, directed not against Russian users, but against the administration of a foreign resource that still believes it can violate and ignore our legislation without punishment. Google has not yet responded to requests for comment. Kinstein emphasized that the future of YouTube in Russia depends on the company's actions. If the administration of the resource will not change its policy and will not start observing our laws, it can expect nothing good here, he warned. Russia arrests another high-ranking defense ministry official. A court in Moscow has ordered the detention of Andrei Belkov, 
head of the Defense Ministry's construction division, for two months on suspicion of abuse of power. This is the latest in a series of arrests of high-ranking ministry officials this year. Belkov leads the military construction company, responsible for building military bases, hospitals, schools, and other facilities. The company was overseen by Deputy Defense Minister Timur Ivanov, who was arrested in April on bribery charges. Several other top military figures have also been arrested on fraud or bribery charges. Belkov's arrest is reportedly linked to the purchase of a tomography machine at an excessively high cost during the reconstruction of a military medical center. If convicted, he faces up to 10 years in prison. Ivanov, Belkov's supervisor, was a close associate of former defense minister Sergei Shaigu. President Vladimir Putin dismissed Shaigu soon after his May inauguration for a new term, following widespread criticism of Shaigu's handling of Russia's military setbacks in Ukraine and accusations of incompetence and corruption by mercenary leader Yevgeny Prigozhin. Bodies of Israeli hostages retrieved from Gaza Tunnel, military says. The bodies of five Israeli hostages retrieved this week from the Gaza Strip were held in a tunnel deep underground, according to Israel's military. The retrieval operation, based on recent intelligence, took place in Khan Yunus, where Israeli forces recently resumed operations. Military spokesperson Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari stated that the hostages' bodies were hidden in a branched tunnel about 200 meters long and about 20 meters underground. On Wednesday, Israeli forces recovered the bodies of five hostages who were killed in Hamas' October 7 attack and taken to Gaza. Among the victims were a kindergarten teacher from a kibbutz in southern Israel and four soldiers, both reserve and conscript, who had attempted to repel the Hamas attack. Israeli forces advance in southern Gaza, tanks active in Rafah. Israeli forces have pushed deeper into several towns on the eastern side of Khan Yunus in southern Gaza and tanks have advanced in central Rafah. Over the past day, airstrikes and shelling have resulted in the deaths of 30 Palestinians, according to health officials. On Wednesday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told U.S. lawmakers that he is actively working to bring hostages home. He is scheduled to meet U.S. President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris on Thursday. The recent fighting has been concentrated around the towns of Bani Su'ayla, Al-Zana, and Al-Qarara. On Wednesday, the Israeli army found the bodies of five Israelis who were killed in Hamas' October 7 attack on Israel and had been held in Gaza. Gaza's health ministry reported that Israeli military strikes in eastern Khan Yunus killed 14 people on Thursday bringing the total death toll in Gaza over the past 24 hours to 30, with 146 injured. Hamas militants had taken over 250 hostages and killed 1,200 people during their raid into southern Israel. In response, Israel vowed to eliminate Hamas in Gaza, a conflict that has resulted in the deaths of more than 39,000 Palestinians, according to Gaza health officials. Several people were wounded in the eastern towns due to tank and aerial shelling, while an airstrike east of Khan Yunus killed four. In Rafah, Israeli bombardment intensified near the border with Egypt, with tanks operating in the north, west, and town center. The Israeli military stated that forces in Khan Yunus killed dozens of militants and dismantled around 50 military infrastructures. In Rafah, they killed two militants. In a speech to the U.S. Congress, Netanyahu expressed confidence in the efforts to release the remaining hostages but did not mention a ceasefire. His comments were criticized by Hamas as pure lies and disappointed many displaced Palestinians who had hoped for an end to the fighting. Diplomatic efforts for a ceasefire, backed by the United States, seem to be on hold, with Israel expected to send a delegation for more talks next week. In northern Gaza, an Israeli airstrike on a house in Sheikh Radwin killed four people, and seven Palestinians detained by Israeli forces were released near the border and taken to a hospital in central Gaza. Jeffries defends Tlaib protest at Netanyahu speech. House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, DNY, defended Representative Rashida Tlaib, Dmish, following her silent protest against Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu during his address to Congress on Wednesday. Jeffries emphasized that Tlaib was representing the voters in her district, saying, Rashida Tlaib is an elected member of Congress. 
She has a responsibility to her district in the same way that I have a responsibility to my district. Talib, the only Palestinian American in Congress, held up a small sign accusing Netanyahu of being a war criminal and guilty of genocide. This act was in protest of Netanyahu's handling of Israel's war with Hamas, which began after the terrorist group attacked Israel last October, resulting in the deaths of approximately 1,200 people and the kidnapping of 250 more, according to Israeli authorities. Netanyahu has vowed to eliminate Hamas, launching military operations in Gaza that have caused mass displacement of Palestinians and a humanitarian crisis nearing famine, according to the United Nations and international aid groups. The Gaza Health Ministry reports that almost 40,000 people have been killed, with women and children making up the majority of the identified deaths. In May, the International Criminal Court's top prosecutor recommended charges against several Hamas leaders for their role in the October 7 massacre, as well as against Netanyahu and his defense minister for their response to the attacks. The charges against Israeli leaders include using starvation as a weapon of war and intentionally targeting civilians. Netanyahu rejected these accusations in his address to Congress, calling the charges of starvation a complete fabrication and asserting that Israeli forces have made significant efforts to protect civilians while targeting Hamas militants. He stated, the Israeli military has dropped millions of flyers, sent millions of text messages and hundreds of thousands of phone calls to get Palestinian civilians out of harm's way. Despite these efforts, the conflict has resulted in significant collateral damage, including the deaths of tens of thousands of Palestinians, hundreds of aid workers, and journalists. Among the casualties were seven aid workers for World Central Kitchen, a food relief group, killed in an errant Israeli strike in April. Talib, who represents a significant Muslim population in her district outside of Detroit, has been one of Netanyahu's most vocal critics in Congress. She brought a Palestinian-American to the speech who had lost 150 members of his extended family in the Gaza war and condemned congressional leaders for inviting Netanyahu to the capital, calling the invitation utterly disgraceful. Republicans quickly criticized Tlaib for her protest. Representative Nancy Mace, RSC, referred to her as Iran's useful idiot, while Representative Randy Weber, R. Texas, suggested she should be run out of town. Tlaib was not alone in her opposition to Netanyahu's visit. Many other Democrats, including former Speaker Nancy Pelosi, D. Califf, boycotted the speech and instead met with family members of the October 7 hostages still held in Gaza. Pelosi described Netanyahu's speech as, by far the worst presentation of any foreign dignitary invited and honored with the privilege of addressing the Congress of the United States. Netanyahu labels critics of Gaza war, Iran's useful idiots in Congress speech. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu used his address to Congress on Wednesday to sharply criticize those protesting Israel's ongoing war with Hamas in Gaza. Netanyahu disparaged anti-Israel protesters as Iran's useful idiots, framing their opposition as being aligned with the interests of the Iranian regime. The speech came at a pivotal moment for the conflict as U.S. officials remain hopeful about the possibility of a deal to free hostages held by Hamas and end the war. Netanyahu's speech, which lasted nearly an hour, focused heavily on defending Israel's military actions and attacking his critics, including Iran, the International Criminal Court, and protesters. Netanyahu's address was marked by a defiant tone as he pledged to fight until we achieve victory. He downplayed Israel's role in the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Gaza, which has seen more than 39,000 Palestinians killed and left the region in severe distress. The Prime Minister dismissed allegations of genocide and war crimes, calling them utter, complete nonsense, and a complete fabrication. The speech was met with significant protests both inside and outside the U.S. Capitol. Reports indicate that protesters managed to gain access to Netanyahu's hotel in Washington, D.C., causing disruptions. Despite the protests, President Joe Biden and Secretary of State Antony Blinken have affirmed the right to protest while criticizing rhetoric that they view as anti-Semitic. Netanyahu also referenced a statement from U.S. Director of National Intelligence Avril Haines, who clarified that while Iran is attempting to influence protests, it does not imply that American protesters are acting in bad faith. In his speech, Netanyahu painted protesters broadly as supporting evil 
and accused them of siding with rapists and murderers. He emphasized Israel's right to self-defense and thanked President Biden for his support, despite their strained relationship. The speech highlighted divisions within Congress, with some Democrats choosing to skip the address in protest of Israel's actions in Gaza. Representative Rashida Tlaib, D. Mish, made headlines by holding up a sign accusing Netanyahu of being a war criminal and guilty of genocide. Other Democrats, including Senator Bernie Sanders, also chose not to attend. Netanyahu's visit to Washington is set against a backdrop of intense debate over the Israel-Hamas conflict, with Biden and Netanyahu scheduled to meet later this week. The U.S. president has expressed concerns over the war's conduct and its impact on civilians, suggesting that the conflict might be driven in part by Netanyahu's political needs. Hamas leader in West Bank dies in Israeli custody, Palestinian body reports. Mustafa Mohammed Abu Era, a Hamas leader in the West Bank, has died in Israeli custody due to a deterioration in his health, according to a statement from the Palestinian Commission of Detainees Affairs released early Friday. Abu Era, 63, passed away after being transferred from Ramon jail in southern Israel to a hospital. The Palestinian Commission claimed that Abu Era had serious health issues before his arrest and alleged that he was subjected to torture and deprived of necessary medical care following his detention in October of the previous year. There has been no immediate response from Israeli authorities regarding these claims. The Palestinian Prisoners Association reported last month that at least 18 Palestinians have died in Israeli custody since the onset of the Gaza War on October 7. The conflict has seen significant casualties, with Hamas-led attacks resulting in the deaths of approximately 1,200 people and the capture of over 250 hostages, according to Israeli figures. Gaza health authorities report that more than 39,000 Palestinians have been killed, with the vast majority of Gaza's 2.3 million residents displaced due to the ongoing violence and widespread destruction. Southeast Asian diplomats meet with China amid rising tensions over maritime claims. Top diplomats from Southeast Asia met with China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi in Laos on Friday, as tensions escalate over Beijing's expansive claims in the South China Sea. The discussions come amid growing friction, with several ASEAN members, including Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Brunei, holding territorial disputes with China. These disputes have led to direct confrontations, raising concerns of a broader conflict. Indonesian Foreign Minister Retno Marsudi emphasized the seriousness of the situation, warning that any misstep in the South China Sea could escalate into a major conflict. Indonesia has also expressed concern over China's encroachment into its exclusive economic zone. The United States and its allies have conducted military exercises and patrols in the region to assert their right to navigate international waters, drawing criticism from China. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is set to arrive on Saturday for the ASEAN Foreign Minister's meetings and is expected to meet with Wang on the sidelines. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov is also participating in the meetings and has already held direct talks with Wang. China, a key ally of Russia, is focusing on enhancing strategic coordination with Moscow. The European Union's top diplomat, Josep Borrell, urged ASEAN ministers not to overlook the conflict in Ukraine, highlighting its global economic impact. Tensions between China and the Philippines have intensified, notably after a collision between a Chinese vessel and a Philippine supply ship near the disputed Spratly Islands in June. ASEAN members, including Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, and others, have stressed the importance of not becoming a proxy for any power, aiming to remain neutral amidst U.S. and Chinese influence. They are also working on a South China Sea Code of Conduct to address ongoing issues. China and the Philippines have recently reached a deal to address confrontations without conceding territorial claims. However, internal divisions within ASEAN on how to handle China's maritime claims were evident with some members opposing the inclusion of specific incidents in the joint communique. The situation in Myanmar, another ASEAN member, is also under discussion. Thailand is playing a more significant role in humanitarian efforts and has pledged additional funds for aid in Myanmar. The ongoing civil conflict in Myanmar, following the military coup in February 2021, continues to challenge ASEAN's efforts for peace. China 
which supports Myanmar's military regime, plays a complex role in the region, maintaining relations with both the regime and ethnic armed groups opposing it. U.S. states begin divesting from Chinese companies amid rising tensions. Amid growing tensions with China, several U.S. states are taking steps to purge Chinese companies from their investments. Missouri, Indiana, and Florida have led the charge in restricting public pension funds from investing in Chinese firms, highlighting a new dimension of opposition to China. Missouri State Treasurer Vivek Malek has pushed for the state's retirement system to divest from Chinese investments, making Missouri one of the first states to do so. Malek is using this move as a key campaign issue in his re-election bid, stressing the need to cut financial ties with China. Indiana became the first state to enact a law requiring gradual divestment from certain Chinese companies. By March 2023, Indiana had reduced its investment exposure to China significantly. Missouri also implemented a divestment plan, which is underway despite initial resistance from some trustees. Florida, under Governor Ron DeSantis, has also moved to divest from Chinese companies. The state board overseeing its retirement system is working on a plan to complete this divestment by September 1st. As of May, Florida still had substantial investments in Chinese entities, including banks and energy firms. In contrast, Arizona recently vetoed a bill that would have mandated divestment from companies in foreign adversary countries, including China. Governor Katie Hobbs argued that the bill could harm Arizona's economic growth and investment portfolio. Investment officials and economists have expressed concerns that these state-level divestment policies could weaken returns for retirees. The National Association of State Retirement Administrators has argued that such decisions should be made at the federal level based on specific security or humanitarian concerns. The push to divest from Chinese companies is part of a broader trend of U.S. states also targeting Chinese ownership of American land. Many states have enacted laws restricting foreign ownership of agricultural land and other critical areas. This movement reflects a growing confrontation between the U.S. and China, making it more challenging for federal authorities to manage the overall relationship amid a patchwork of state-level policies. North Korean hackers stole military secrets, FBI reveals. In a major cybersecurity breach, North Korean hackers have stolen critical military secrets, including data on satellites and warplanes, from NASA, U.S. air bases, and defense contractors. The FBI has launched a manhunt for the perpetrators and is offering a $10 million reward for information leading to their identification. The hackers, linked to a North Korean group known as Andarial, managed to infiltrate NASA's computer systems for over three months, extracting more than 17 gigabytes of unclassified data. They also accessed defense company systems in Michigan and California, as well as air bases in Texas and Georgia. The U.S. State Department has identified a North Korean national, Rim Jong Hyok, as being connected to the group. Rim and his associates have reportedly targeted U.S. hospitals and healthcare providers to extort ransoms and fund their cyber operations. The stolen data includes unclassified technical information about military aircraft and satellites some of which is over 14 years old. The Andarial Group is just one example of the increasing cyber threats posed by state-sponsored hacking cells from North Korea and China. Recent disclosures highlight the broad and relentless nature of these threats to U.S. national security. For those working in critical infrastructure, the FBI and the UK's National Cyber Security Center are urging the implementation of security patches and improved protection measures to safeguard sensitive information from such attacks. India and China agree to urgent troop withdrawal on disputed border. In a significant diplomatic development, India and China have committed to urgently working towards withdrawing the tens of thousands of troops stationed along their disputed border. This decision comes as a result of a meeting between Indian Foreign Minister Subramanyam J. Shankar and Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, held on the sidelines of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations meetings in Laos. The focus of their discussions was the line of actual control, LAC, the long Himalayan border that separates Indian and Chinese-held territories, stretching from Ladakh in the west to Arunachal Pradesh in the east. This line has been a point of contention between the two countries, with China claiming Arunachal Pradesh in its entirety. 
Tensions between India and China escalated in July 2020 following a deadly military clash that resulted in the deaths of at least 20 Indian soldiers and four Chinese soldiers. Since then, the standoff has seen both nations deploy tens of thousands of troops along the rugged border, supported by artillery, tanks, and fighter jets. While some progress has been made with troops being withdrawn from areas like Pangong So, Gogra, and Galwan Valley, both sides continue to maintain a significant military presence. The foreign ministers emphasize the need for complete disengagement at the earliest to restore normalcy in bilateral relations. Jay Shankar highlighted that the ongoing border issues have cast a shadow over India-China ties despite substantial efforts to resolve them. He noted that the state of the border directly impacts the overall state of relations between the two countries. Wang Yi echoed the sentiment that improving relations between China and India would be beneficial for both nations and others globally. Both sides have agreed to collaborate on maintaining peace in border areas and advancing the disengagement process. The line of actual control, a legacy of the 1962 border war between India and China, divides the physical control of the area, though there remains a discrepancy in the length of the border as claimed by each side. Discussions between top military commanders from both countries continue as they work towards resolving tensions and achieving a stable and peaceful border. Doctors react to Biden's address, concerns over emotional display and cognitive health. Following President Biden's address to the nation on Wednesday night, which announced his withdrawal from the 2024 presidential race, several doctors have shared their assessments regarding his health based on the live speech. In the address, delivered from the Oval Office, President Biden briefly discussed his decision to step down from the upcoming election but did not address recent health concerns such as his recent COVID-19 infection, ongoing cognitive health issues, or the recent assassination attempt on former President Trump. Dr. Mark Siegel, a clinical professor of medicine at NYU Longoni Medical Center and a Fox News medical contributor, observed that Biden appeared to be reading from a teleprompter, which made it challenging to evaluate his true health condition. Siegel expressed concern over Biden's apparent lack of emotion during the speech, suggesting that it might indicate a state of depression or shock. It is a very emotional time for him, and he isn't showing it, Siegel said. He seems to lack conviction, he added, feeling compassion for both the president and the American public. Dr. Robert Lufkin, a California-based physician and professor at UCLA and USC, also commented on the speech. Although Lufkin has not examined Biden personally, he noted signs of cognitive deterioration in the president's previous appearances. He pointed out that Wednesday night's presentation, which relied heavily on a teleprompter, was less demanding than unscripted events, which might explain the lack of apparent cognitive issues. Dr. Ernest Lee Murray, a neurologist at Jackson Madison County General Hospital, mentioned that while the format of the speech was less challenging and appeared to show Biden in a more relaxed state, Difficulties with reading can be a sign of dementia, although he has not treated Biden. Murray noted that Biden's performance seemed better than in debate settings, possibly due to the less rigorous nature of the teleprompter-driven speech. The White House, in response, stated that health concerns were not a factor in Biden's decision to withdraw from the 2024 race. They emphasized that the president is focused on finishing his term and achieving more historic results for the American people. Judge threatens sanctions against Hunter Biden's attorneys for false statements. A federal judge has threatened to impose sanctions on Hunter Biden's attorneys for allegedly making false statements in their legal motions. U.S. District Judge Mark Scarcey issued an order on Wednesday requiring Biden's legal team to explain why they should not face penalties for inaccuracies in their filings. Judge Scarcey criticized the attorneys for falsely asserting that U.S. Attorney David Weiss did not bring charges against Hunter Biden until after being appointed as special counsel. According to Scarcey, these statements are incorrect and the attorneys are aware of their inaccuracy. Biden's legal team recently filed motions seeking to dismiss his criminal charges in California, where he faces accusations of filing false tax returns and tax evasion. They also asked a Delaware judge to dismiss his federal gun charges, which led to a conviction last month. Their filings referenced a recent decision by U.S. District Judge Aileen Cannon to dismiss charges against former President Trump, 
arguing that the appointment of special counsel Jack Smith was flawed and similar issues should apply to Biden's case. Judge Scarcey clarified that Weiss brought the initial charges against Biden in his role as U.S. attorney, not as special counsel. This distinction is significant, as Biden was expected to plead guilty until his plea deal fell apart last year, leading to his indictment and preparation for trial. Scarcey emphasized that the misstatements in Biden's motions are serious and criticized the attorneys for misrepresenting the proceedings. He has given Biden's team seven days to respond to the order. Failure to provide a satisfactory response could result in sanctions.